I just need to begin by saying, it's so good to be with you this Easter. You know, those joining us online, those outside as well. Last year, it was just me. I was lonely up here, you know. It's not the same. But here's the deal. The tomb is empty, therefore the church should be full. So praise God, right? So here's what we're going to do. I was kind of putting myself in, in your situation, you know, it's, it's like, Every Easter Sunday, the sermon is going to be kind of predictable, right? I mean, we have a theme that's been given to us, and for good reason, because the resurrection explains a whole lot. Like, for example, how did Christianity come to be a thing? Why is it still here? Yeah. Um, what, what happened? You know, it was like there's this fledgling little small group of Jesus followers in the first century AD. 2,000 years later, hundreds of millions of Christians the world over. How did that come to be? How about this? You ever ask this question? How did we get this? Why do we have this? The Bible is the most read, most cited book in history. How did we get it? So the resurrection answers that question as well because what happened was these early followers of Jesus and those who didn't follow Jesus, they had these experiences where they saw, spoke with, actually dined, learned from a post-crucified Jesus. And because of that, they were like, we have to write down our experiences. We have to tell people about this. Nobody's ever done this before. Jesus is who he said he was. Give me the pen. Give me the paper. We got to record this. The resurrection explains why we have Christianity, why it's a thing, why we have the Bible. In its day, though, more than anything, what the resurrection gave was hope. Now, I don't know if there's been another time in my lifetime where there's more of a sense of hopelessness in our world than now. The last 12 months has been rough on everybody worldwide. It's like nobody's escaped it. It's affected all of us. Easter has the solution for that. So maybe you're here this morning and maybe you've never been to church before. Let me be the first to say, so glad that you are with us. Maybe you attended church in the past, but something happened. Maybe you were hurt or wounded or offended. Something happened. Maybe there's some relational conflict, and you just kind of drifted away. But now you're here. You're not here by accident. Maybe somebody invited you, and again, this is all new to you. My, my hope for you is that your heart and your mind would just be a little opened this morning because what I'd like to do is I'd like to take you on a journey and I'd like to tell you the story and the story I'm about to tell you actually comes from those who had a front row seat to the life of Jesus see many people misunderstand the Bible they think it's just a, a collection of really inspirational things let me just make it clear you don't come to Christianity because it inspires you if you want inspiration you can dial up Oprah Tony Robbins you know there's a lot of people that will inspire you you don't come to Christianity to be inspired you come to Christianity because it's true and so we have these letters, we have these writings from these people who encountered the resurrected Jesus. And what's more interesting is that the style of writing doesn't fit fiction of its day. No, the genre is eyewitness. And so this is all part and parcel of the story. And, and how, do we, how do we come to know that Jesus is who he said he was? Everything is sort of that exclamation mark. Everything hinges on the resurrection. It's like the apostle Paul said, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, go home. <laughs> Christians, he says, are to be pitied. And that's a great statement because essentially what he's saying is you're all so gullible. But you know what's interesting? Nowhere in the scripture does it say that Christianity is a blind faith. In fact, it says the opposite. The Bible says, come let us reason together. And then as you sort of work your way through who Jesus is, what happens is then your heart begins to melt. 
It's not just for the head, it's also for the heart. And so what we're going to do is we're going to begin with um, this guy named Mark. And so Mark was an early follower of Jesus. He records some of the details surrounding the death of Jesus, specifically what happened shortly after the crucifixion. In Mark chapter 15, verse 43, we read this. Joseph of Arimathea. So he introduces us to this first character. His name is Joseph. The area that he's from, Arimathea. And then we learn that he's a respected member of the council. What council is that? Well, it's the council of religious ruling elite. They were known as the Sanhedrin. A small group of guys, they made all the decisions that affected the religious life for Jews in the first century AD. So he was also himself looking for the kingdom of God. He understood that the kingdom of God was going to come and the kingdom of God has to have a king, so who would that king be? So he's getting curious. He's heard about Jesus. A lot of people have. Jesus has been doing some supernatural things. Word is beginning to spread. People take notice. And this guy, even though he's part of the ruling elite, and by the way, this is the same group that decided Jesus should be executed. He's one of them. But there's something going on inside him. He's open-minded and open-hearted because he hears about Jesus. He's learning. Could Jesus be the king in God's kingdom? He wants to know. So he took courage and went to Pilate and asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Another really cool thing about the Bible is that, you know, hey, look, don't just take my word for it. Uh, Archaeology bears witness to the things that are mentioned here. And so a few decades ago, archaeologists discovered this man, Pilate, his existence, his position, his place in the first century AD. Think of him as a Roman governor. So the Jews had a lot of freedom. They didn't have the freedom to carry out their own execution. So Jesus is hanging on the cross. They had to go to Pilate to get permission to get his body down. And so here, here comes this guy. He's a secret. He's some, somehow, it seems like he's a secret follower of Jesus because he cares enough to get the dead body of Jesus and he's going to take care of it. Pilate was surprised to hear that he, Jesus, should have already died. He's kind of surprised because although the Persians invented crucifixion, the Romans perfected it, and, and the way of perfecting it was to just, just draw it out, make it as painful as possible, and part of that was the humiliation. You're hanging there. You're mostly naked. You're basically at eye level with people. It's a rough, rough way to die. So he's surprised. So you're getting all these little details that don't advance the plot other than they fit eyewitness narrative. Okay, that's important to know. So he's like, he's already dead. This is, you know, he died so soon and summoning the centurion. He asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, he said, here you go, Joseph. Take the dead body. It's yours. It's not like people are lining up to take care of it. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. This would have been his own tomb prepared for him when he, di- when he was about to die, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Then you have these two ladies that show up. By the way, you know, at the death, at the, at the arrest, the trial, the crucifixion of Jesus, basically most of the guys were like, well, I'm out. See you later. It's getting really rough right now, you know. But the ones who stayed closest to Jesus were the ladies. And these two Marys have been with them the whole time. They're super loyal Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where Jesus is laid. So they're they're close. They they witness the crucifixion. They're there. They see where Jesus is being laid. And what's their disposition? It's sadness. You know, it's sorrow. They followed Jesus. They committed their lives to him. They watched him die death by crucifixion, laid in this tomb. Here's the really interesting thing about them. They don't expect Jesus, in this moment at least, to come back from the dead, which is really interesting, really, really interesting because so many times Jesus said things like, destroy this temple, destroy this body, and in three days, I'm coming back. This was well known. This is one of the reasons why They placed guards in front of the tomb so that nobody would mess with the body of Jesus because here's the deal. If you could produce Jesus' dead body on day four, Christianity is over. It's totally, you go parade his dead body around the streets of Jerusalem on the fourth day, Jesus is a liar. 
just another false messiah. So, here are these two ladies. Jesus is dead. They're not expecting him to come back just yet because why? Well, Mark chapter 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene mother and Mary, mother of James and Salome, they bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. So back in the day, they didn't have the embalming process that we have now. The body started to decay. And so over the course of time, you would bring spices and more spices because that masked the stench and the odor. So they cared about Jesus. But they're not expecting him to be alive. They bought the burials. They, they're expecting him to be in the grave. So very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, okay, um, who's going to roll away the stone for us so that we can get in there and take, Jesus, take care of Jesus' body? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they're about to encounter something that just absolutely shocks and rocks them to their core. Frightens them. They saw a young man sitting on the right side. He's dressed in a white robe, and they are alarmed. You know, but, you know what are you doing in the tomb of Jesus, man? What are you doing sitting there in a white robe? Matthew, another really cool thing about the Bible is that you have all these different eyewitness accounts happening, and they just come together so beautifully. Matthew writes about the same account, and he says that this is actually an angel. So this angel shows up, and the women are kind of terrified, but the angel speaks and calms them down. He said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. And then he drops this on them. He is risen. He is not here. I'll prove it to you. See, look right here. This is where they laid his body. He's not here. So the ladies come in. They see this, they're out of their minds. They're wondering what's going on. They get the information. Jesus isn't here. They're looking. They're inspecting. They're, yep, yep, yep. Well, okay. What's happening? He did what he said he was going to do. He came back from the dead. And, and, and so then they get this charge. The angel tells them, here's what you need to do. You need to go and tell his disciples and Peter. Now, Peter is already one of the disciples, so why would he emphasize, make sure you tell Peter? I think it might be because Peter denied knowing Jesus not once, twice, but three times. And he needs to be assured that Jesus is the Messiah. All of the guys had a sense, maybe, but you see... Like a lot of other people, they wanted Jesus to lead this massive political revolution. And instead, Jesus comes and he says, I'm, you're going to have to lay down your sword. I'm not here to lead that. Here, you're going to have to lay down your sword of dependence. Because I'm about to lead a revolution of the heart. Yeah, come and save us from Roman rule. And Jesus is like, no, I'm going to come and I'm going to save you from yourself. Because... That's a worse master to you than the Romans. And people are like, I'm out. No thanks. That's not what I'm down for. So they go and they tell the disciples, they tell Peter, and what happens next is Peter and John, they don't fully believe the ladies. They got to see for themselves. So they sprint to the tomb. They check it out. And even the two of them aren't fully convinced yet. Now, isn't that interesting? You would think that if you're going to write a story, you're going to fabricate, fabricate something, you know, and make it up, get people to believe it. Jesus is going to be the hero throughout the story. Nobody doubts what he said. He's all good. There's all these fantastic things that surround him. But instead, what you're reading is what actually happened. People were still kind of like, I'm not so sure. There's this scene. Well, let me just read it to you in John chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked. Why? Because they were in fear of the Jewish leaders. Here's what they're thinking. It says doors, plural. They're, they're behind like several locked doors. Why? Because they're, they're thinking, ah, they just killed our leader for blasphemy. And um, we kind of went all in on him. What does that mean for us? So they're all huddled together. They're afraid, that's what the text says, for fear of the Jewish leaders. These are the religious leaders, the ones who offered Jesus up to be crucified. And then this happens. Jesus just... He just appears. Just like he has this ability to pass through material objects. And he said exactly what they needed. This is what people in our own time need today. He says, peace. Peace be with you. 
And then he doesn't leave it at that. Because again, they've got to be convinced and persuaded. And so he kind of makes this move. In case there's any doubt, go ahead. Take your hand and physically touch my wounds and become persuaded. Believe it's really me. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And as a result, the disciples were, and I don't know if it's, this word is probably an understatement, but it's probably the best English word we have to translate the Greek. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. This is the moment in history that things begin to change. Because understand that these men went from being a frightened group of essentially cowards into men who would die the death of martyrs. Some of them excruciatingly painful deaths. Something happened. This is why I say there is no Christianity without the resurrection. It's like the, the, the spark was lit and then these men would begin to turn the world upside down. If this whole thing was a hoax, if they all got together and they said, hey, let's just, let's just tell people Jesus came back from dead and we'll write these stories and we'll put them all together and we'll conv- it'll be the biggest lie in the history of humanity. Let's do that. Let me tell you, at the point where they start driving nails through those guys, somebody's going to crack. You know, it's really fascinating. You know, um, people will say to me, well, Jason, you, you believe what you believe just because it's in the Bible. The question you need to be asking is, how did we get it? And what is it? Again, we would not have this if it wasn't for the resurrection of Jesus. That's how important it is. That's how compelling it is. There's no reason to write these accounts if they didn't happen. Unless people were totally fired up and lit up and they're like, This is game on. We can't ignore this. We have to tell people about our experience. You know, in fact, it says at one time, Jesus appeared to more than 500 people at once. And then the author says, many of those people are still alive. Go do your fact checking. You want to fact check what I'm saying? Great. Go talk to them. Many of them are still alive. They'll tell you the same story. Go for it. You don't make those kinds of statements if you're fabricating a story because it could very easily be disproven. And yet none of that happens. What happens? Actually, it's like this gas that gets thrown on Christianity because people are fact-checking. Even the enemies of Jesus were talking about their experiences. Jesus brought this guy named Lazarus. He was a friend of Lazarus. Lazarus dies. Jesus brings him back to life. And all of a sudden, the people are like, oh, okay, we might want to listen to what you have to say. That's some serious street cred, bringing someone back from, from the dead. And the enemies of Jesus, again, the religious leaders, they have a big problem. John chapter 12, when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, that's in this little town of Bethany just outside of Jerusalem, this large crowd of Jews, there's, there was no social media, there's no TMZ, they're not getting their news that way, right? The word of mouth, so Bethany's a small town, Lazarus is there, Jesus raises them back to life, and all of a sudden, whoa, everybody's telling that story, it reaches the big city not far away, big old crowds are going, well, check it out, I got to see this guy Lazarus. They're coming, they're doing their own fact checking, they're asking people, hey, where's Lazarus's house? And they show up and Lazarus is like, <laughs> I'm back, you know. And the religious leaders are super upset by this. Why? Jesus saved his harshest words for religious people because they were so self-righteous. Same is true for many today. That's why Jesus never came to establish a a religion. It was a relationship. Not a religion. It was a relationship. It's all relational for Jesus. So here's what they have to do. They came not only account of him, Jesus, because they've heard about Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Big news, verse 10. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. We got to end this, because if this guy keeps parading his live body around, it's going to get bad for us. So let's kill him. Because on account of him, look, many of the Jews were going away, away from them, their leadership. They were losing their credibility, their power, their authority, and they were believing in Jesus. 
consider those who actually crucified Jesus, who actually did the work of crucifixion. They couldn't deny something happened, so they had to make up lies to cover it up. Matthew chapter 28. So while the women are on their way to Mary's to tell the disciples, Peter, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that happened. So when Matthew records this event, he says that when that angel shows up before the Marys see him sitting in the tomb, the angel shows up and the guards are out of their minds. They're totally just like, and they run away. They're afraid. What's really interesting is that the text uses the Greek word kustodia to describe these guards. You might already know that this is like the, the elite fighting team back in the day. This was the Navy SEAL, the Green Beret. They were trained to guard small plots of land, and if they failed, the price was very high to them because they would pay with their lives. But they're out of their minds because something supernatural happens, and they're like, mm, and they run away, and they tell their story to those who are in charge. But the chief priests in some way intercept them. The chief priests had met with the elders and they devised a plan. They gave the soldiers a large sum of money and they're like, okay, here's what you need to say. Because they're coming back now and they're like, oh, hey, by the way, uh, not only is, did Jesus bring Lazarus back from the dead, um, sorry to tell you that the tomb is empty. So here's what you're to say. His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. Now, that's so ridiculous. People use that argument today, right? And they don't even realize that it's actually in the Bible. So here's the deal. So it's like, okay, um, this story is so unbelievable. You mean that these, these ragtag group of fishermen are going to overpower the custodio deal. There ain't no way that's going to happen. Nobody's going to believe that. So that's why they have to say this. If this report gets to the governor, we know you're going to be in trouble. So we will satisfy him, and we will keep you out of trouble. Isn't that interesting? That's why it's there, because they understand what's at stake. They need someone on the inside to help them. So the soldiers took the money and did exactly as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So this is written a few decades after the events. So a few decades after this, this is still the story that's being circulated. Well, you know, the tomb is empty. Well, yeah, you know the disciples stole the body, right? <laughs> now, again, what's interesting is these writings are not in the style of fiction, but they're in the style of eyewitness accounts. That's why you get all these really obscure details that serve no other purpose other than, it's not like they advanced the plot in any, any way other than, they just actually happened in this way. So I love how honest the Bible is. Yeah. And, and I love how relevant it is because there's at least one person in the story somewhere that you can relate to. So maybe you're listening and you know, you're thinking this. Okay, so you're telling me that you believe that this Jew who was born into obscurity, born of a virgin, claimed to be the son of God, was crucified, and was raised the third day. He came back to life. You, you tell me that's what you really believe. Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. Yeah, that's what I believe. By the way, there's a mountain of evidence to believe that. Again, not a blind faith, but a reason, reasonable faith. And you're saying, I doubt it. I'm highly suspicious. You know what? You're actually in really good company because there's this guy who was close to Jesus. His name was Thomas. And he was a skeptic. He's like the empiricist of the group. You know, I think it's like an Enneagram 5. Those people are so annoying. You have to have every T crossed, every I dotted, right? You are a fact checker. You want to investigate for yourself. Thomas is your guy. John chapter 20. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, which literally means twin. So the guy was a twin. He was one of the 12, one of the original 12 with Jesus. This guy, he saw the miracles. He saw Jesus do his thing. He's not fully persuaded yet about resurrection. He was not with the disciples when Jesus came and visited them originally, right? So the other disciples told him, we've seen Jesus, man. Thomas, we saw him. And Thomas was like, please, unless I see him. No, no, no. Not enough for me to see him. I want to touch his fresh wounds. I want to, I want to pick, take my finger and I want to put it inside that nail hole. Then I'll believe. If I can't do that, I'm not going to believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, no need for Jesus to knock, apparently. He comes in, he stood among them, and he says the same thing. 
peace. Now, it's great because whatever follows peace, get ready. Something heavy is about to happen. Peace, man. Thomas, I got something for you, buddy. This is just between you and me now. Go ahead. See, all throughout the Bible, it's so cool. Jesus gives people exactly what they need when they need it. Same is true with you. Gives them exactly what they need when they need it. Thomas had his doubts. It's not like, like Jesus looks at Thomas, nor does he look at you. And he says, shame on you for having your doubts. Shame on you. And he says, you have doubts? That means you're questioning. That means you're engaging. Fantastic. Keep engaging. Let's have, let's, let's, are you open-minded? Are you open-hearted? Awesome. You're in the right place. You will be persuaded. As long as you keep that attitude, you keep that perspective, you're going to be persuaded. And you know what? Thomas is won over. How do we know? Because in verse 28, Thomas says this. He says, my Lord and my God. For a Jewish man to look at another Jewish man and refer to him as his God, that was blasphemy and punishable by death. In other words, Thomas said, got it. Consider James, the brother of Jesus. Yeah, he, he has his own eyewitness account that he writes about him. James perhaps has the biggest obstacle of anybody because it's really hard to fool a family member. I have three brothers. They're older than I am. And I guarantee you, none of them has ever mistaken me for the Messiah. Not once. <laughs> Normally, and I'm a really good guy. Um, yeah, if I came back from the dead, they'd be like, he's faking it. He's totally faking it. Um, it's, it's really hard to fool your family. And when James writes about the life of Jesus, his own brother, he calls him his Lord and Savior. Come on now. Maybe... Maybe you can relate to Thomas, maybe James. Maybe it's hard for you, James. You've got to be persuaded by the lifestyle. Jesus had it. Um, maybe it's more like Peter. We mentioned earlier, Peter denied Jesus three times. And you know what, Jesus, you know what Peter does? You know, this is even after he's heard about Jesus being resurrected. He's had all of these post-resurrection experiences. You know, you know where Peter goes? He goes back to his old life. Isn't that interesting? He goes back to fishing. Peter doesn't immediately become this world changer. He actually goes back to fishing. And, and he meets Jesus in Galilee on the shore, just as Jesus said he would. And the scene is so beautiful because Jesus is there on the shore and the text tells us that he's preparing some fish and bread over a charcoal fire. You're like, what's the big deal? Why, why tell us that he's preparing over a charcoal fire? You know, he could have been using a Weber for all we care. What does it matter? You know, a charcoal fire? Like, who cares? See, Eyewitness account, the details are important. So the last time, well, quite frankly, the only other time a charcoal fire is mentioned in the New Testament is when Peter is standing beside it and he's denying Jesus. And what Jesus does is he says, um, hey, Peter, I've got some breakfast for us. That's a sign of hospitality. That's actually, that's saying, hey, we're friends. Hey, Peter, you and I, were good. We're good. You know, Peter doesn't immediately become his world changer. He goes back to his old life. Why? Because this is a guy that struck out three times. You can't get any worse than denying Jesus three times in a row. So all the guilt, all the shame, he's like, I am so far from God. See, maybe that's where you're at. You're like, you just don't know what these hands have done, where these feet have taken me. You don't know what these eyes have seen, what this body has engaged in. There's no way God would accept me into his family. I am too far gone. You ever denied Jesus three times to his face in person while he was with you after being with him for three years? That's a pretty big failure. And we, what does Jesus do? He says, can I just tell you, the reason why I came to this planet was to offer forgiveness of sins. And Peter, if I didn't do that for you, everything I've ever done, everything I've been about would be unwound. So Peter, let's eat together. And then he says, Peter, do you love me? Now, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? 
He asked him three times, perhaps once for each time Peter denied knowing him. And then it's so cool because it's like he picks Peter up, he dusts him off, and he says, Peter, time for you to get back in the game because you're the rock now. And you are going to be instrumental in building the church. And you can just sense the life coming back into Peter. It's like, as he receives grace and mercy and forgiveness. When Jesus came, he said in John 10, 10, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. We got a lot of people on this planet that are living. Nah, they're existing, but they're not living abundantly. So no matter where you're at, there's something in the story for you. Let me read you some of the last words of Jesus. To his disciples, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. He's like, my father, the creator of everything, if you can imagine this, he has a house. Imagine what that house is like. Oh, it's filled with rooms. And if it wasn't so, I wouldn't have told you. He said, but I'm actually going to go. I'm going to go, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. See how specific, see how relational this is? It gets better. He says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Jesus is coming back. You know that because he came once. He's coming again. And I will take you to myself so that we can be together. So here, here's, how, here's how it goes. Jesus said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. Now, here's the question we all have to answer, okay? And this is the most important part of our time together. If Jesus went to prepare a place for you, have you prepared yourself to meet the one who went to prepare a place for you? Have you prepared yourself to meet the one who went to prepare a place for you? You say, how do I do that? The Bible is so explicit, and it gives us, again, another really harsh dose of reality because it says that every single one of us, we kind of want to do our own thing. It's, it's within every human heart to just, you know, establish, establish ourselves as God Almighty. That's what the Bible calls sin. That's why the world is so jacked up, by the way. That's what the, the source of all of our problems is. It starts with you and me and our self-centeredness. Jesus came to take all of that junk on himself. Why? Because God is holy and just. And a penalty must be in place. We have court systems. When people do bad things, we expect justice to come to them. Okay? It's just, that, just how it is. Why would you not think God is going to sit in the same seat? You think God's just going to turn a blind eye and go, whatever, just do your own thing, I don't care. No, he wouldn't be just if he did that. So there has to be this penalty that's paid. And on the cross, Jesus paid your penalty. The Bible tells us that him who knew no sin, Jesus became sin on your behalf. So all the junk, all, all the wrongs, all the mistakes, they fall on Jesus. He dies, his blood is shed so that you could live, so that your eternal destination could be Secured. So when God looks at you, he looks at you through the lenses of his son. So, you know, look, I can't let you leave the room, even if you're online with us outside. I'm going to ask you to do one thing, and that is this. Bow your heads, close your eyes, free yourself from any distraction. If God is really tugging at you like he's never tugged at you before, or maybe you've heard some things today that you've never heard before, man, but they are hitting you heavy. Can I just encourage you to give in? It's like I said, Jesus didn't come to tell you, hey, pick up your sword. There's going to be a revolution. He said, actually, why don't you just lay down your sword? Lay down your sword of dependence and depend on me. And, and to, it's like what he said to the thief on the cross who trusted him. He's like, hey, I'm going to take you home. So if that's the desire of your heart, you simply say a prayer. Prayer is talking to God, and you just, you just express it. You say, God, I admit what it, I know is true, and that is I do wrong. I miss the mark. But all of those wrongs have fallen on Jesus, and I accept it. And in return, I receive forgiveness, grace, and mercy 
I'm made part of your family. And this is the, my favorite part because I get to say, man, welcome to the family of God. If you've made that decision to say yes to Jesus or to commit your life to him anew in some way, we would love to know about that. Before you leave, take your phone, scan the little QR on the back of the seat or on the screen that's there now or outside on one of the signs. We would love to connect with you, tell you more about who Jesus is and help you on this journey. That's why we're here. And let me just say, we've all been in that place before, right? We've all been there. So Father, as we leave today, for those of us that are so familiar with these texts and these stories, God, I pray that we would find affirmation. What we believe is not in vain. What we hope is not in vain. Jesus did what he said he was going to do. That changes everything. It changes us. And Lord, like those who came before us, Father, may we be changed so that we can then be change agents in our world. All for the glory and the fame and the renown of your son, Jesus Christ, your resurrected son, Jesus Christ, on this Easter Sunday. And God's people said,